Next, a look at artificial intelligence in healthcare. Please welcome Don Rucker, National Coordinator for Health IT for the Department of Health and Human Services. Leading the conversation is Atlantic staff writer Olga Kazan. Thank you. So we're here to talk about uh, the use of technology in a field that's not often associated with being at the forefront of technology. I know you're trying to change that. Um, but so let's start out with, with kind of a look at the problem. You know, we all know anytime you have to deal with anything related to the doctor's office, you know, we were talking backstage, uh, you're looking at, you know, 45 minutes on the phone, you're looking at a lot of faxes in some cases, it's a, it's a little behind the times. Kind of lay out, why is healthcare kind of a little bit retrograde when it comes to technology? Yeah, so um, I, I think the reason the healthcare sort of lags uh, is really fundamentally because of the way we pay for it. So healthcare is not really in a consumer market economy, right? We have, for a variety of reasons actually, dating back to World War II and um, how tax, health insurance is a pre-tax benefit put a lot of third parties in and they don't really have our consumer interests frankly first and foremost that's sort of understandable you know they have a mix of their interests some version of our interests um so it sort of keeps us out of just the main consumer economy I see. But, but we're trying to change that. This right, right. Okay, so I want to talk about the, the two th major rules that came out that are trying to, trying to get at that. So can you kind of describe the two, the two rules that are out right sure. now? Sure. So under 21st Century Cures, December 2016, um, so passed almost unanimously, 390 votes plus in the House, 90 in the Senate, signed by President Obama. It's something that uh, President Trump and the White House are very, very strongly in favor of is getting consumers back in the game, getting consumer choice in. Um, and what does that mean today? Obviously, at a, at a session like this, it really means getting the medical record, your chart, onto your smartphone. That's the computer we have. Mm -hmm. And so within Health and Human Services, um, there are two rules that are actually out for public comment until June 3rd. If you go to healthit.gov, you can see the uh, Office of National Coordinator. So we're the agency that coordinates healthcare IT, e e electronic medical records, if you will, then with CMS that pays for Medicare, Medicaid, those programs. And so we have two rules to get um, the American public back um, into computational control of their data as a start to actually really being able to shop. So in the ONC rule, we are um, requiring of electronic health records, so of providers, doctors, and hospitals, that there's an application programming interface mm -hmm. um, with then secure technology, OAuth2, for, for those who, are, who know that, to allow you to direct your smartphone at your provider's EMR and download your data. We're starting with some structured data first, but eventually it will be all the data. CMS has a companion rule to um, require the payers to download your claims data. Mm -hmm. um, so they're already doing that with something called Blue Button 2.0 for Medicare fee for service, but are going to extend that to Medicare Advantage Medicaid. So the, the, the entirety of it is you control the data, and then once you control it with an with apps of your choosing, not of the provider's choosing, of your choosing, then I think the things we're talking about here, like you know, artificial intelligence, really can really come in in a consumer economy because it's going to be your choice of app that is going to drive the services. So you can actually look at your phone and say, oh yeah, my vitamin yep. D levels are low, you know, yep. as opposed to now you have to call your doctor and say, what yep. was Yeah, or log on. We've, so we've some prior rulemaking, there are portals, but you know, the more people you go to, the more portals, the more passwords. Yeah. And I, think we, I think we know that experience. It's, it's not consumer friendly. And the, the purpose of the, the insurance companies having the claims data downloaded, what, it, what will that help? Well, well there, there's an interesting thing. So there are two people who actually need data. So the claims data, the advantage to the public is A, you can see what's, you know, a little bit more transparently what's happening. And then I'm guessing folks are going to aggregate that into shopping apps and, and, you know, sort of, you know, a better version of 
starting on the road to price transparency. There's other policy things um, going on in the works there, but um, you know that's still a work in progress. Interestingly enough, to this this theme here, the payers who buy healthcare on our behalf actually aren't able to download the electronic records either, oh. right? So if you're a large American health payer and you're trying to figure out, should I use this network or that network? Should I you know, contract with Georgetown or GW or MedStar or Hopkins? And where can I get the best deal on behalf of us as consumers? Believe it or not, they don't actually have access to the electronic data either. So part of what we're doing at ONC is working with large payers to do a modern restful JSON with, uh, with a healthcare add-on called Firefest Healthcare Interoperability so that they can get the data on our behalf. That doesn't exist yet. It is just coming out. Wow. Okay. So. And we've, we've heard a little bit of this before with something called meaningful use. Now, this was several years ago. I remember writing a story uh, where I interviewed a bunch of doctors. You know, they, you know, I said, what do you think about the new electronic health records rule? And they said, I'm keeping my paper charts. I'm not using the computer. And they were very grumpy about it. So how did that go? And what's, what's going on with meaningful y use? Right yeah. Now? <laughs> so meaningful use is largely, um, th there was a program that came out of the high tech stimulus and this was so think 2009 um, and this was an effort to basically gin up the economy and so then the rules were really about the fiduciary responsibility on the 30 billion dollars that went into ehrs um i think it is pretty commonly acknowledged by everybody that didn't fully work out the way um it was hoped and that would be an understatement um and i think it was actually largely there are still vestiges of this just because of, of various laws that remain. But I think most of that is really um, was actually withdrawn pretty much by the prior administration I who, see. who also started it. And so now, I mean, and I think you mentioned something like you're, you're trying to get it to um, be more focused on, on freeing the data to the, the patients as opposed to having the provider yes. have all the data. Yes. The, there are, in the Cures Act, there's actually... Um, prohibitions against information blocking, right? Because often a lot of um, the, if you look around the American landscape throughout the country, the business model often for healthcare providers is buy every competitor hospital and then stick it to the payers on your pricing. That's not a technical term, but if you're wondering why healthcare costs are going up, that is the business model. So, you, you know, I'm not going to iterate through the cities in America where you can see that, but there are quite a few of them. D.C. is a relatively competitive market, so this is not one where you would really um, look at that. And so much higher prices, and in that business model, you want to prevent something called leakage, mm -hmm. right? Patients going elsewhere. So there's a natural tendency to want to keep that information a little bit close to the vest. Under the Cures Act, those type of behaviors are actually now illegal. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn to audience questions in just a little bit. So be thinking of your questions. But first, I want to ask you about something that's it's it's just so um, I think important to a lot of patients, which is is price transparency and even like network transparency. Right. I spent a lot of time the other day trying to figure out if an anesthesiologist was going to be in network for me, and it was it was probably at least ten phone calls and more than three hours of time. And it just seems that's like a lot of wasted, you know, inefficiency. So is, is that anywhere on the horizon to? Yeah, that, I mean, that is clear? exactly what we're trying to do. I mean, yeah. right, this is everybody who's had an experience. I mean, if you just want a routine visit, I mean, I had to do something and it took me 20 minutes to make a follow-up appointment. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the, so we think, you know, Application programming interfaces, modern computing has solved this in every other industry. So we're really trying to open that up in healthcare to get these new business models. Price transparency, because of the historic complexity, is a complicated issue. We're starting with transparency in the chart just to actually get your data so you can shop, right? So you can say, if you don't like that provider, you have your data and you can go elsewhere. But I think part of that is price transparency. We are looking within the administration at what we can do there. As you, as folks know, um, you know, we have to look what we can do in the executive branch because um, we're probably not going to get any health care reform from the legislative branch, <laughs> um, though there's a lot of interest in surprise billing what, you, yes. what you're describing. So, you know, there will 
probably be some things hopefully uh, jointly there, but we just need transparency everywhere in the system and having applications programming interfaces to have that transparency be computational. It's not enough that you write a rule that says, if you call and spend three hours on the phone, you might get the information, right? That's totally unmodern. Right. What we need is that you can get it on your phone right away. Right. So that's what we're working on. That would be ideal. Um, I want to see if anyone has questions and we should have mic runners coming to you. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Halla Flynn. I work in higher education and I'm a master's student at Syracuse University. I had a question about the implications of informed consent in the medical field. So traditionally, clinicians have an obligation to make sure they have informed consent from a patient before they provide treatment. How does technology play into whether you can identify if a patient has felt informed before they give their consent, whether that's um, using a patient portal, collecting their information, or using telemedicine? Yeah, you know, on, on one level, informed consent is easier because you have a log file, right? I mean, it's very hard to fake up a log file. Um, I suppose it can be done. But so on one level, the documentation is almost self-documenting. I think what your question is getting at is maybe that richer issue that I know was covered earlier this morning on how do we really inform people on secondary uses of data? Now, in healthcare specifically, all of that is actually illegal, right? So under the HIPAA Act of 1996, health insurance portability is what it was originally about. It turns out that what providers and their business partners can do is tightly prescribed to very specific things around treatment payment operations. So in healthcare today, that is illegal. When you, under what we've just talked about, download the data onto your smartphone, you under your HIPAA right of access, that is, then anything that happens downstream is your responsibility, right? It is your, at that point, it is your data, it is your responsibility. And then we're in the question of how do we, you know, what is, you know, how do we talk about secondary use of data? What are the consent things? I, this will probably, I think, end up in Congress if for no other reason than with your, the GDPR, some of the California rules, a variety of other state rules. Um, it, is in, it, it is really in play. And initially, of course, you have to realize your health data is permanent, right? So, it, so you want to be very careful in wh who you, down, you know, what apps you use to download it. And we're going to see, I think there'll be branding there. I think we're going to, the same way we just wouldn't go to somebody on a corner and use a person in a cart for our banking, right? I mean, we're going to use a name brand that we've heard of and the bricks and mortar somewhere, maybe not on your smartphone, but yeah. somewhere. Um, so we think that there's going to be branding and again, the type of consumer market that's been missing in the rest of healthcare branding is part of that. Um, ethics and trust are part of that. So we think that will actually come in as this. Right. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I'm Life Briarly with Johnson & Johnson, and I was just wondering if you could speak to ONC's perspective on connected medical devices and the interaction with um, health systems and health information systems. Yeah. So, obviously, the, the world of Internet of Things, right, is, is upon us, and this is... <coughs> It's just starting. Everybody's heard of, you know, the Apple Watch and the EKG and, and the glucometers and the digital scales. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot more there. It is one of the great opportunities to materially lower the cost of healthcare using AI as a surround. Um, healthcare, certainly inpatient healthcare is incredibly labor intensive. If you've ever been on a med surge nursing unit, the amount of energy that's spent in fairly ill-defined um, activities. And part of that is really instrumenting things. Part of having crisp, modern APIs, which we haven't historically had in healthcare, is to allow that to happen in a reasonable kind of way. Um, so that is, uh, that is what a lot of this work is about. Again, we're using the RESTful JSON and Fire stack to do that. That's, RESTful and JSON is what those, um, trans, you know, that sort of data movement 
and formulation standard is what powers most apps on cell phones today. I can't actually see the audience, so flag down a mic person if you have questions. <laughs> Okay, well, I have a question, which is, so as we talk about, you know, Internet of Things and getting your data, you know, and, and, you know, I put in my number of steps or whatever, or it tracks me when I run, is that, what's the balance between, oh, it's great, I've, like, closed all my rings today, and, you know, not having that sold to someone, how do we, should we be worried about data privacy, is that, is that not really a concern, or what's being done about that? Yeah, I think you, you absolutely have to be worried about it. Now, I think on some level, we've made an implicit deal that much of our data is going to be shared, right? If you have a smartphone on you, which I'm guessing in this audience is right at 100%, <laughs> um, right? We have essentially made a little bit of a, or a lot of a deal, right? Every time you do a Google search, every time you fiddle with Facebook, all of that information is there. I think people, again, I think the probably the best way to solve that is with branding and consumer trust. That is the way we do it, and consumer trust is hard to get. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't buy food that doesn't have a label on it, right? You, there is no unlabeled food. Every piece of food, pretty much, that has manufacturing to it in your grocery store has either a general brand or a specific house brand. So we have a lot of experience with safety around branding. I think that will happen. I think people will get good at tracking things. I think um, we still as a country have to do a lot of work on you know, informed consent. And this, it, this is much broader, as you point out, Olga, than just your medical record, right? If your um, accelerometer says you're just sitting around all day, right? That is a lot of health information about you, right? That would allow me to write an insurance contract against your life or your health insurance at probably a hundred, you know, at a twofold difference. Right. Um, just based on that piece of information alone yeah. and being smart about those patterns. So I think we have to look at, at the totality um, of that. And it, it is a world that is evolving. Right. Is that, is that already how, because there's John Hancock, right, is doing the, I, th I thought they were doing the um, insurance plans where they can actually, you get a discount if you're more active. or if you I've, I've seen that. I don't, I don't know who's doing it. I, I saw one that I think if you can do an eight minute mile, um, you get a certain rate. Um, I guess I'm not up for that one right, right. anymore. <laughs> taking advantage of that deal. Well, thank you so much, Don Rucker. Uh, thanks right. for being well, here. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.